several things uh, coming up. We've got the roofing project coming up this Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Even if you haven't signed up, if you're able to help, uh, come on and help. I think we're starting at 8 in the morning each morning on that. Uh, there's all kinds of jobs to do. If you don't get on the roof, you can still do things uh, on the ground. Uh, and Sunday, we have the fall family picnic at 430 and there's a sign-up sheet. If you're planning on coming, you don't have to sign up. If you feel like, I'm not sure, and then you can come later, it's okay. We're just trying to kind of plan for food on that. So if you can fill that little sheet of paper out, if you're planning on coming, fill that out for us. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Let's stand together. You have called us out of darkest into your glorious light that we may sing the wonders of the risen Christ. May our every breath retell the grace that broke into our strife with boundless love and deepest joy within your blessing comes that we may praise, may praise the name of Jesus. All the earth is yours and all within, each harvest is your own, and from your hand we Brother Jeff's starting a new series on prayer this morning. These next two songs that we sing together, you could lift them up to the Lord as a prayer this morning.
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. to hear God's word this morning proclaimed. May this be our prayer to the Lord that he speak to us and we hear. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your shape and fashion us in your likeness that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your ask the Lord to teach us full obedience and take control of our thoughts. Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your pure Truth prevail over us. 
Father, we just uh, pray for Brother Jeff right now, Lord. And through him, you might speak these truths through your word. That we might know that you are holy, you are righteous, you're all-knowing, full of grace and mercy. Lord, open our eyes and our hearts and our minds as we've just sung, that we might know you better through the preaching and the hearing of your word. We thank you and we praise you in the name above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen. Be seated. Or it was pray or it was read your Bible, like, you know. And so I, I always was good because I would just throw one of those out. And, you know, if you, your answer is God, your teacher's typically not going to tell you you're wrong. Um, but, you know, I, I went to college, studied the Bible, went to seminary, studied the Bible, taught the Bible, been preaching the Bible for about 30 years. And, you know, it, it still comes down to prayer and reading your Bible. It really does. It's, it's uh, as I mentioned many times, Christianity is a simple, simple idea but it's very complex to live out and to understand. And prayer is not something as anything, and I just want you to kind of step back and be logical about this. Like everything that we're asked to do as sinners, nothing righteous is going to be easy for us or second nature. Okay? So when we're little, you know, they say prayer is just talking to God. And that's great for a four-year-old. That's not great for a 40-year-old. Prayer is very complex, and oftentimes when we think about talking to God, we think about talking to God the way that we would talk to each other or, you know, a good friend. And, and you know what? Jesus is our husband. Jesus is our friend if we obey him. But I, I, I think we have to understand that it's sometimes more like we're, we're in the, the, the foxholes, and we have, it's wartime, and we have walkie-talkies. And we're trying to figure out how to survive. And in those moments, prayer becomes a lot more real. You know, there are times when couples have conversations and they're just talking about, you know, should we move or relocate or, you know, what should we do with our health insurance or, you know, what are we going to get the kids for Christmas? Those, those are conversations. Unfortunately, those are usually the conversations that we have with God. Just basic, very surface. Let's try to solve one problem at a time. But ultimately, what our, our communion with God is about, our conversation with God is about, is about the things the Bible talks about, which is ultimately the, the soul, the eternal things, the opportunities that we have in this life that we'll never have again, that once we're done here, everything we can contribute is pretty much gone. You know, we're often concerned about, you know, feeling good about our life and the people that we love and the people we care about. And I think we need to talk to God a lot more about what he's concerned about. And so prayer is, is a discipline, as Christian scholars would call it. It's something that we have to really set aside our life in order to do correctly. It's just like singing. It's just like playing a sport. It's just like playing an instrument. Just because you like music doesn't mean that you can play the trumpet. Like you have to discipline yourself to learn the instrument, and if you really love the instrument, you will discipline yourself to do it. If you want to sing and you want to do it right, if you want to do it correctly, it, it takes some time. If you want to just say the words and do the best you can and go off key like I do, knock yourself out. But I would never call myself a singer, and I would never offer to do special music, you know, because I understand it's not, I'm, I have not put the effort in to become that person where I could say the Lord has given me a gift and I polished it. Prayer is a gift. Prayer is something that God has given each of us to commune with him. And so when we just kind of in passing say a few words here or there or before a meal or before bed, in passing have that conversation, I don't think it's ever going to mature us. C.S. Lewis, and, and this is what's so key, C.S. Lewis said, 
prayer is not meant to change the heart or mind of God. Prayer is something that we submit to to change us. And so going into a conversation with a perfect and holy God, every time we go into conversation, we're looking in a mirror and we're seeing the sin in ourselves and we're leaving with some marching orders, or as we say in the business world, some action items. And if you don't leave your time of study, if you don't leave your time of prayer with some action items and some things that the Holy Spirit's laid on your heart, I'm just going to tell you, you're probably not doing it correctly. If you're not coming away with some assurance about the things that you're struggling with, if you're not, not coming away with having taken your anxieties and laid them on the altar and being able to walk away from them, if you're not coming away with some marching orders, then you're probably not doing prayer correctly. And so... I would say that just what we see here in this morning, this, this prayer 101, basic prayer in Luke 11 is the Lord's Prayer. We all know the Lord's Prayer. We've all heard many sermons on the Lord's Prayer. We've sat in Sunday school and talked about the Lord's Prayer. But ultimately, what we need to realize is that Jesus gave this prayer at this time because one of the disciples saw him praying and said, Lord, can you teach us to do that? Now, I just want you to think in your life, the people in your life that you have seen or watched pray and you thought, man, I wish they could train me to do that. There's not a lot of people in my life. I'm sorry. Because prayer is something we get through. Prayer is something we do out of habit. Prayer is something we do in the order of the service. But ultimately, it's not this communion that we have with the Lord. I can remember when I came here back from seminary 20 years ago. And even we pastors had a hard time praying correctly. We get so wrapped up in the things that are today. You know, so-and-so has surgery, and so-and-so needs this, and so-and-so that, and, you know, you know, Aunt Nellie, you know, her puppy's sick. Whatever. We pray about all the things that concern us, but we never really get into this intimate moment where we feel like the Holy Spirit can pour what he wants into our souls. And that's what matures us. And that's what grows us. And if you do prayer correctly, you want to do it more. You know, I, I went to school to learn how to read the Bible. I think that's important. I went to school three times to learn how to read the Bible. As I taught people how to read the Bible and as I preached the Bible and taught the Bible, I continued to educate myself because understanding the Bible's hard. I'm not, I'm not talking to four-year-olds. We're not just seeing Jesus loves me, this I know because the Bible tells me so. But we're talking about how love actually is still true when God flooded the earth and all the babies and women and children that were involved in it. How is that love? God is love, but there's a lot of things we don't talk about in Sunday school. And there's a lot of things that we don't read about. And there's a lot of things we don't understand we skip over. And that's where prayer comes in. The Bible is meant to take us to the feet of Christ so that we can have a conversation about what he's already said. Some of the strangest ideas in church history, theologically, have come because people will talk to God and they think they're hearing from God, but they don't have scripture in their heart. And so it really does come down to praying and reading your Bible. I've had people tell me that they don't believe they have to forgive a person. And I say, have you read the Bible? I've had people tell me that when we die, we'll be part of the Bible. Have you read the Bible? I've had people tell me that they, they prayed about it and God said that it was, it was okay for them to get a divorce and it wasn't because of infidelity and the unbeliever wasn't departing. And I said, I don't think you're right. God doesn't think you're right. And this is when it becomes so important for us to have this communion with the Lord so that he can open our eyes and open our hearts, that he can open our minds and that he can help us to desire him more than anything else. If your prayer does not make you love God more, if your prayer does not draw you more into his presence, if, if your prayer life is not something that is growing you and inspiring others to ask questions, we need to start over. And we need to rethink it. It's gotten us this far. It's not like it's destroyed us. But if we truly want to follow him, if we want to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and truly know who he is, we've got to rethink it. And so this is prayer 101. And that's not just a cute little thing. I actually am going to test you after this. And if you don't pass, you will be flunked out of the kingdom of God. Okay? I'm kidding. Sort of. Anyway, <laughs> 
I, I used to tell students that if they, it was Bible class and if they failed, they would go to hell when they die until one kid really thought I was being honest. But he got saved, <laughs> which was, the Lord spoke through a donkey. So, you know, here I am. <laughs> Example one. The main point is this. There is a proper way to pray, and God will show it to us if we care to know. And you know what? That's really what the whole Bible's about. God is introducing himself to his people. He's called us out by name. He knows us. He knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows us intimately. And he is saying to us, if you really want to know this stuff, I want to show it to you. If you really desire to know me, I want to reveal myself to you. And so prayer is the way that, that we go about communing with him. So point number one says this, effective prayer comes from a desire to pray correctly. So looking at uh, Luke 11, verses 1 through 4, it says it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, that after he had finished, one of his disciples, whom we don't know who it was, said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, well, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And that's it. You say, well, that, that's not the Lord's Prayer. Okay, yeah. We're used to hearing it out of the Sermon on the Mount, which we've already gone through because we talked about how Jesus spoke about prayer. So I want to turn over there just for a second to give some context. In Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5, remember he talks about giving to the needy and giving alms, and then he talks about prayer, then he talks about fasting, then he talks about money, okay? So when he's talking about prayer, he says, when you pray, this is chapter 6 of Matthew, verse 5, you are not to be like the hypocrites, the actors, because they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. He says, I truly say to you, they have their reward in full. So the Pharisees were praying to be seen to people. The Pharisees were praying to be seen or perceived as righteous. Okay, We don't need to pray in a way that is speaking to other people. I call that preach praying. When you're talking to God in a congregation, you're not talking to the people. You're talking to God on behalf of the people, okay? That, that's, that's how that works. So you're not quoting scripture. You're not letting people how, know how well you're versed in the Bible and how well you understand theological things. Usually what we need to say to God is, God, get our attention. We know we've made some mistakes. Would you reveal those to us? Let us be sensitive to you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the way the Pharisees did it. He says, but when you, you, when you pray, verse 6, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your father. And he uses that word father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And the intention there is openly. So this is how you see a blessed life. If you see a blessed life, it's not an accident. If you see a blessed life, it's not just defined on, on how much money they make or, or how beautiful their family is or, you know, any, it's not based on that. Like, sometimes seeing a blessing is really hard to understand. I would have never looked at John the Baptist and said, now there's a blessed man. I would have said, like the rest of the people, there's a crazy man. Right? This guy is nuts. He's insane. What's he doing? Why is he eating locusts and wild honey and, and, and wearing clothes? What's wrong with this guy? And why does he keep yelling at us? And who's this Jesus he keeps talking about in this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Who's ever heard of anything like that? Okay, but he became the standard for what it meant to lead Christian folk. That's why the disciple in Luke says, this is what John used to do. Could you teach us to pray as well? Okay, and then he goes on and he says, when you pray, verse 7, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do because they suppose they will be heard for their many words. Okay, don't do it out in the open. Don't do it to be seen of men. And, and, and don't try to use big words. Okay, now this is where we get the concept of prayer is just talking to God. It is just talking to God. But it's not talking to God like you're four. It's talking to God, like for me, I've, I've known him for 41 years. Talk to him like you've been married to him for 41 years. Okay? It, just because I've known him that long doesn't mean I've matured all 41 of those years. I mean, sometimes we, we get, we're like children spiritually. 
but we go into teenagers, and then we become kind of selfish, and then we think about, well, what's this, what's this, why didn't I get that, that's unfair, and then you kind of grow into maturity, and you realize that it really isn't about you, and then that's why people who've been around a while are much better at praying than people who haven't, because they've worked spiritually through those levels. There was a, a time when I really wanted to write a book that was called What to Expect When You're Perfecting, and going through the, the, the levels and the changes of spiritual growth, because it's so hard to understand. But like I said, you know, I, I, I remember talking about this when I was at Prince Avenue. I had somebody come up to me, one of the most fervent Christians I knew at the time, and he said, how mature do you think I am, Pastor? And I said, how long have you been fervently seeking the Lord? And he goes, oh, about two years. And I said, yeah, that's about right. And he was in his 30s. It was a little offensive to him. But I'm like, listen, it doesn't, going to church doesn't count. Saying you're a Christian doesn't count. Fervently seeking the Lord counts. Denying yourself every day, that counts. And most of us, if we accumulate that, you know, in America, it's not many years because we haven't been forced into desperation. We do know where our next meal is coming from. We don't have a government that oppresses us. And so our conversations with the Lord are much more casual. Then he goes on to say, don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, that is what's amazing. You are not going to bring up any new news to God. You're not going to say anything in a way that's going to impress him. And you're not going to say anything that's going to make him love you any more than he already does. You're not going to say anything that's going to make him love you less than he already does. God already knows what you need to talk about. Do you? That's what Jesus is saying. Do you? If, you, if you're only doing it to be seen of men, Pharisees, if you're only doing it with big fancy words, do you really know what God wants to talk about? And then he went ahead and he quoted the Lord's Prayer. Now, this is a different instance. This is not the Sermon on the Mount. This is not just a retelling. This is them again asking, which probably was after the Sermon on the Mount, Lord, teach us to pray. I guarantee you Jesus wasn't over there saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You go to John 17, that's how Jesus spoke to the Father. On our behalf, and we've talked about this, it's intense. Like, Jesus was an intense prayer. And so when the, we're going to go to Gethsemane. We're going to go to John 17 in the sermon series. The, sweating drops of blood, that's pretty impressive. That's really some strong communion here. And so you could imagine he could have just been praying about anything. He could have been praying about his earthly mother Mary. He could have been praying about the disciples. He could have been praying about the Pharisees. He could have been praying about the temple. Who knows? But when they saw Jesus pray, they said, Lord, teach us to do that. And if we have never had the Lord lead us by the hand through the process of maturing in him, then we're not there and we'll never be there. You know what? I, I, I wish there was a place where, where they could have said, Lord, teach us to worship. I think our concepts sometimes are just so surface. And I, I, I'm sitting here not even facing you, and I can hear when you're worshiping and when you're just singing. And I can obviously hear when you're not singing. Like, you can tell. You can tell when the Spirit of God is moving amongst his people. When the people are communing with the Holy Spirit. It's not rocket science. Like, he says, John 10, my sheep know my voice. And the one thing I get from Christians, how do I know the voice of God? How do I know the Lord's talking to me? How can I figure this out? You're his sheep, you should know. Well, how do I know? You read your Bible, and you pray. And you, you let that intensify, you let that soak in, and everything then you have, a conversation with him, is about what he's already revealed. The most frustrating thing as parents sometimes is when you have to repeat everything you just said to your kids or to your spouse, right? I know that gets annoying. People have to repeat things to me all the time. But folks, why do we have to rehash the fact that God's sovereign every time we pray? Why do we have to bring up the fact again that we don't have enough food to get us through the month? He already knows that. Let's start talking about the things that he is interested in talking about. And so looking then at the text, he says, teach us to pray. And he said, okay, this is how you need to say what you're doing when you pray. Father, your name is holy. Father, your name is holy. He calls him Father. Not God, but Father. You're not talking to a foreign God who doesn't know you. 
You are talking to your father who created you, birthed you, adopted you, and is raising you. It's a different conversation. You're not going up and talking to an uncle. You're not going up and talking to some stranger in the church. You're not going up and talking to a pastor or a deacon or a minister. You are talking to your dad. You're talking to the one who has been looking out for you from before the foundations of the world. The one who knows everything about you. And while you were still a sinner, Romans 5, 8, he died for you. That's who you're talking to. So you need to go to him and say, I'm scared. He knows you're scared. It's okay. You can say, Lord, I'm scared to death. But don't act like he doesn't know that. Don't act like he's not already intervening. Don't act like he's just waiting there, wringing his hands, not knowing what to do. He knows everything and he's your father. And besides that, he's holy. Do you know what that means? That means he's not like us. He is otherly than us. He is different than us. He is incomprehensibly different than us. We cannot fathom how different God is from us, and yet he's our father. And when you pray, know that. Get that. Let that sink into you. You know, this is not just a simple conversation. You're not kids anymore. You've been following them a long time. This is an intense time for you to go and just say, I know you love me. And I know I don't know near as much about you as I need to know about you. You're holy. That's a pretty powerful statement. Then he says, your kingdom come. Okay, and then the other, it's your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But God, we need you to expand your kingdom. Most of our prayers, mine included, are about God expanding my kingdom. The prayer of Jabez, man, that sold a lot of books, didn't it? The prayer of Jesus, not so much. I read both of them. The prayer of Jesus is the model prayer, not the prayer of Jabez. Expand my territory and bless me and do all that. Folks, it's, it's not unbiblical. It's in the Bible, but you have to understand it. That is not the first thing Jesus wants to talk to you about. Jesus wants to talk to you about the sin that's in your life. The stuff that's hindering us from truly knowing him and following him. He wants to talk to us about why we think we're so busy that we don't have time to really seek him and understand him. He wants to talk about the fact that every time we get our feathers ruffled a little bit, we just quit coming to church. That we just don't have any commitment to him whatsoever. That we think church is about us. That we think our opinions really matter. They don't. These are the things he wants to talk to us about. But unless you're going to go to him and say, you are my father, which means you love me and you're my boss, and you're holy and I can't understand you, and I want your kingdom to come on this earth, like there's not much to talk about except surface stuff, right? I've tried to counsel people before. I've tried to help them reconcile. Folks, if they're only worried about talking about what they're ticked off about and how the other person annoys them, that's not love. If you've got a laundry list, then Paul himself says love doesn't keep records of wrongs. Right? He says right here, forgive others. I, you forgive me as I am forgiving others, actively doing so. Like, you can't live your life like that. And so that's why our prayers don't really get that high up to heaven. We ask for our daily bread. Let's be honest. Most of us can figure that out on our own. They couldn't. They couldn't. They were poor. They were nomadic. They were a people without a land, basically. This land had been promised to them, this great land of Abraham, a land flowing with milk and honey, and they never had really possessed it. They had a sliver of it, but they never really owned what God wanted to give them. They had been in rebellion. They had been in captivity. You know, they're, they're, these people are Christians, who many of them are Jews, who are living in a land that speaks Greek and is ran by the Romans. And asking for dinner was a big deal. Asking for God to intervene was a big deal. But our prosperity has killed our faith. We don't depend on the Lord for anything. We're entitled. We think we deserve this, that we, we should expect this. And then we compare ourselves to other people who have more than us. And this is just not how we commune with God. We go to God and, well, folks, if you have food, great. Be grateful for your food. But what is it that we need from God today? 
Why did God create this day? Why does he have us on this earth one more day? What is he trying to get out of us? What is he trying to show us about himself? What is it? Talk about that. You say, well, Jeff, I don't know what that is. Read your Bible. Seek counsel. Spend more time in communion. If you don't know why God extended our stay one more day, this Sunday morning in October 2020, you need to talk to him more. If you can't come to grips with the fact that, that he's still a faithful God in the midst of a pandemic, you, you, need, you need to converse a lot more with him. And you need to know him a lot more. And you need to try to understand him. Like that, that's what communion is really about. And he goes on and he says, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who has indebted us. This here is accomplished action. We're already forgiving people. So we can freely ask you to forgive us. But the expectation is not that God forgive us because our cleansing is what's most important. There are two great loves here. Our love of God and our love of neighbor. And if you don't have both, you don't have either. But Jesus had both. Jesus modeled both. Jesus inspired us with both. His love for his father and his love for humanity. He died both for his father and for humanity. And he says, listen, if you, if you love each other, lay down your life for each other. But I would imagine the number of people that we would do that for is limited. And the number of people that we would live sacrificially for is even smaller. It's easy to say we love. It, it, it is difficult. It's easy to say that we're forgiving people. It, it is difficult to forgive. And then he goes on and says, and lead us not into temptation. So on your sheet, number one, God is exalted. Okay, that's how to pray correctly. God is exalted. You can also write down Father there. Okay, he's your Father, but he is holy. Number two, our dependence on him is acknowledged. We need God. God does not need us. God is not asking us because he needs us. God did not create us because he needed fellowship. God created us because he's God and he's sovereign and he desired it and he deserves it. And unless our understanding of God is somewhat huge, then we're really not going to understand who he is and how this relationship works. You know, there's a reason why I'm here as your interim pastor. You need me. You know what else? My family and I need you. That's how God does church. That's why you're all here. We need each other. And if we don't understand that we need each other, then, then we're never going to see what God is trying to accomplish. We're never going to understand that. But if we keep asking the questions about me and my own, if we keep praying about me and my own, we really, in our thinking, shrink God majorly. And we don't allow him to be who he's supposed to be. Our dependence is utterly upon him, even if we think it isn't. Just imagine if a pandemic happened overnight. Imagine if oxygen stopped overnight. Imagine the sky falling to the earth overnight. A couple meteorites, folks. Our utter dependence on God is, is huger than it's ever been in the history of the world. The key is to understand that while you're being prosperous. To really knowing him and depending on him, even in the midst of prosperity. Number three, forgiveness slash reconciliation is sought and promised. I would say, biblically, don't ask for God to forgive you if you aren't willing to forgive others. The two work together. And I, I, there's five or six scriptures that Jesus himself spoke that, that say the same thing. And I've read them to you. If you're not a forgiving person, don't expect forgiveness. Which logically says to me that Christians are forgiving people. Christians don't destroy other people's lives. It's not what we do. It's not how we think. It's not what we're here for. And we don't, you know, you know why you don't forgive? It's two reasons. You're immature in your faith. And number two, you want to hold control over the situation. Christians don't do either one of those things. Is it easy to forgive? No, it's not easy to forgive. Do you think it was easy for God to forgive you? It was not easy for him. But he's faithful to do it every time we confess. And he's just to do it every time we confess because that's who he is Forgiven people forgive. 
Reconcile people, reconcile with others. That's just the way it works. There are no exceptions to that rule. Number four, there's a goal of purity that also is set before God. Effective prayer comes from a desire to pray correctly. Teach us to pray. Okay, this is what that's going to look like. Number two, effective prayer demands persistence. Okay, effective prayer demands persistence. So he, he, he continues on. In Matthew, he kind of preempted prayer by talking about what we read about. Here, he's following away from this question, giving them some examples. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to his, his friend at midnight, and he says to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come from a, on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And, see, and from inside, he answers, and he says, do not bother me. This is his friend. The door has already been shut. My children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you that even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because he is persistent, he will get up and he will give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open because everyone, underline that, who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be open to you. We're going to stop at verse 10 there. I just think it's brilliant that Jesus says, I not only want you to pray in substance, I want you to pray consistently and persistently. God is asking you to bug him. Do you know how you know if your children or grandchildren really want something? They won't let it go. They can't be talked out of it, right? It's something they're convinced they have to have over and over and over. And you know what? If it's not important, they let it go, and you can kind of get their mind off of it. And, you know, maybe the seasons change, people change, needs change, desires change. Folks, what have you for the last year been persistently bringing before the Lord? What will you not give up on? If you don't know of anything, there should be three or four things. If you don't know of anything, then I think maybe you have a reason why he's not answering prayer in your life. God knows what you need before you ask. And you're probably asking for things you don't need. You're asking for things you want. And I've done that. We all do that. We're human. We pray for things that we think we need. We really don't need them. But what's important for us is whatever God wills to happen. Whatever is important for us is the plan that God has put before us. So prayer is not so much us going and trying to get God to give us stuff. It's us coming and submitting to him and surrendering to him for his will to happen. It's us positioning ourselves to accept whatever it is that he wants to do. And folks, that's why the whole Bible is written. We have man and woman after man and woman who... who, who took years to figure out what God wanted them to do. Esther didn't know why she was called where she was until she realized through Mordecai that God had put her in the position as queen to save the Jewish people. And it was still hard for her. And she said, fast and pray for me as I go talk to the king. We haven't talked in a while. I don't know if I'll be received. Sometimes we really don't know until the moment of truth why we are where we're at. That's why that prayer, consistent prayer, is so important because sometimes we find ourselves following a dream. We're not following a dream. We're following a Savior. We're following a Lord. We're following a Father. We're following a person. It's not an idea. It's not a concept, right? It's not a political party. It's not a theological teaching. It's not a career. It's not even a family. It's God. That's who we're following that's who we're looking to. That's who we're trying to understand. I mean, I would never let one of my kids, what's within my power, marry somebody they don't know. But how many of us say, yeah, you're my heavenly father. We don't know anything about him. Yeah, you're my Lord and Savior. We don't understand anything about the cross or salvation. All we understand is what we were told when we were little and we keep repeating, and that is Jesus loves me, and I know this because the Bible says he loves me, and I need to talk to God and make him important in my life and go to church. 
and be nice to people and clean my room and wear my seatbelt. And that's it. That, that's plenty for a four-year-old. That is not plenty for us. That's not enough. The more that we grow, the more he demands of us. To whom much has been given, much will be required. He is asking us to bother him. It's interesting the story he uses here. Okay, He says, a friend, right? It's a friend. They know each other. It's not a stranger who's, who's going to threaten you coming to your door knocking. It's a friend. And he knocks and he says, listen, I had some friends come from out of town. I wasn't expecting them. I need three loaves. So that's just little thin wafers. He's not asking for a lot. Okay? It's not a huge ask. But his friend says, no. Why does he say no? It's midnight. It's the middle of the night, and, and, and everybody's asleep. Now, this is not like our house where everybody had their own bedrooms. They all slept on the floor. These are not big houses. And so for him, he says, I already latched the door. Like, this is a big process. These were not safe times. So he would have had to get up. He would have pretty much woken everybody else up. You know where their animals often stayed in poorer families? Inside the house with them. Why? Because somebody would steal them. So you're talking about basically a circus being created by this one man not having three little slices of wafer because guests came. Why wouldn't he prepare for himself? I don't know. Was he lazy? Was he dumb? We don't know. We just know that, that he was surprised, he had guests, and he had a need. And so what does he do? He goes and he says, friend, I need you, friend. And the friend says, no. Not going to do it. We're not that close. My wife will kill me, right? The, we just got the goat to sleep. Whatever it might be, he had his reasons. It's just a story. But whatever it was, he had his reasons. And he says, Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth. If, if, the one way to get an answer is to not leave. Either you wake him up and give me the bread, or I'll wake him up out here yelling and banging. I, I, it doesn't matter. I need the bread. And eventually, even if he didn't like the man, he would get up just to make him shut up, right? Jesus talked about the persistent widow. Remember what she was asking for? Justice. Justice. She had been treated unfairly. And if you go before a judge and you keep persistently going before a judge, eventually the judge is like, oh, for crying out loud, just give her what she wants. He's not saying we have to annoy him. He's just saying, listen, if you, if you have a, a, a friend who will eventually bend to your will against his own family because you have a need and you won't shut up, just imagine how much more God will listen to you in your hour of need. You just need to be persistent with it. You need to keep praying about it. You need to keep reading about it. You need to keep seeking him. You need to, you, you, so, so what ultimately is the thing that he's praying for you? He says, ask, it will be given. Seek, you will find. Knock, it will be opened to you. And then he says, everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. So it, it seems like there's a seeking of knowledge here. It seems like there's an answer they're looking for. It seems like they're looking for the Lord more closely or to intervene. And he's saying, listen, if you will do that, I will give it to you. Now, on your sheet, there's many verses here, okay? I've just kind of thrown these together, but I want you to make notes. You can go read these later. Here are keys to answered prayer. We're talking about the substance of prayer now. Just some Old Testament verses, some New Testament verses. First of all, we have to have knowledge. We've got to know God, okay? That comes from reading the Bible. That is his infallible, inerrant word. That's where he reveals himself to us. And so when you go to talk to the Lord, have scripture in mind. Jeremiah, when he was praying, and we'll look at that one as well, he was reading the prophet. I mean, Daniel was reading Jeremiah. Daniel the prophet was reading Jeremiah. God's word will bring about conversations with God. So that's why daily scripture reading is very important. And I'm not talking about one or two verses. I'm talking about read the whole thing. Okay? Read a couple chapters. Sit down. Don't look for a devotional thought. Just look for God to speak. When you read five or six verses, God will start speaking to you. You know why? Because you're his child and he loves you and he wants to. And if you seek him, you find him. That's the way this works. So seek him in scripture. Number two, humility and confession is important. I mentioned Daniel 9, Psalm 10, uh, 17 and 18, 2 Chronicles, if you will humble and seek my face. All those folks, you and I have to go into it knowing that he's God, he's holy, he loves us, he's our father, and we don't know anything. And if we go into it 
with a bunch of ideas of the way things are supposed to be. Why did this guy ask for bread? He just needed bread. Like he didn't ask somebody to come over and clean his house. He just needed bread. It was an obvious need that he had, and he was persistent. God will let us know what we really need. Go talk to him about what you really need. We don't need to talk about everything to God. Like he, he, he doesn't need to be walked through all that. He knows all of that. Let's go to him with humility and seek his guidance and his wisdom. Expression of true thankfulness is so key. And that's what Philippians 4, 6, I just had 4, 6. It's Philippians 4, 6. It says, don't be anxious about anything, but but in all things through supplication and, and prayer with thankful hearts, let your requests be made known to God. Come to him with gratitude. Acknowledge who he is. Delight in God. The love of God, that's in Psalm 91. Uprightness, there's your next blank. You, you, you need to be a righteous person, a righteous man or woman. You need to care about the things of God. This is not a Hail Mary. This is not you asking for help in your most desperate of hour. This is you developing a relationship with the God of the universe. And in order to do that, you know, give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. You know, this is what the psalmist said. Created me a clean heart, Psalm 51. Hopefully we'll get to that prayer too. Like, you have to acknowledge that your sin's not okay, but that God's willing to deal with it. If you understand that he loves you more than he hates your sin, he still hates your sin, then then you start to grow in wisdom of him. Remember that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Proper motives is also important, and we just read that in Matthew 6 before he talked about the Lord's Prayer. And then finally, patience. Isaiah 40, verse 31, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount with wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow, walk and not grow faint. All those things are key. John 15, Jesus said basically to his disciples, whatever you ask in my name, he will give you, or that he might give you. You need to come, just like he says here about the food at the neighbor's house, you need to come to the Lord and really expect to receive. Not what you want, but what you need. Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. It really is a full-fledged getting involved, down on your face before God, sometimes just setting in silence. Some of the best times of prayer I've ever had, I hadn't said a thing. I remember one time when a New Edition was performing and we were doing Super Summer. This was back when we used to go to William Jewell and, and we, we really prayed. We were ready to do this thing. We were excited about doing it. And there was just an odd spirit in the room. This was a bunch of junior high and high school kids. And like the things that they should have been convicted by, they were laughing at. And it was just odd. And we all, we, it wasn't planned we all walked off the stage and we just all fell on our faces. And there was nothing in that moment to say. You know what Paul tells us? The Holy Spirit will intercede for us when we have groanings that are too deep for words. You don't even have to know what to say to God. Just spread out before him. Go to him. The next night was a little better. It was not what we had hoped for. It was not what we imagined. But you know what? Sometimes we are there to speak the truth so that people will hear it and repent. And other times we are there to speak the judgment. And you and I don't always know that. But we have to be faithful in what we do. Every time I teach, every time I preach, there are hearts that are being softened by the word of God. And there are hearts being hardened. I know that because that's the way scripture works. You say it over and over and over again. And when people come in contact with God, it hardens them or it softens them. And if you will not be softened, you will not grow and you will not mature. So finally, we see that effective prayer is answered with God's integrity. So verse 11, it it says, suppose one of your fathers, remember he said father, so he's talking about dads again, is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he's asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, oh, by the way, this is how I feel about you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. But you know what every believer throughout the history of the world has always needed? More understanding of God. More understanding of God. Even Job 
said, Lord, I need, I need an umpire. I need a daysman. I need a lawyer. I need somebody to hold my hand and hold your hand. I need that. I need to understand you. I want to know you more. Just like what he's saying. Folks, every believer, that's what they've all had in common, is they needed more knowledge and understanding of God so they could be more faithful and committed to him. That's really all we need when it comes down to it. And he says, listen, if you really seek and you really want to know me, I'm going to give you the greatest gift ever, and that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the upper room discourse in John 14, 15, and 16, he says, it will benefit you that I leave, and the Holy Spirit comes. He will guide you into all truth. He will remind you of everything that I've said. But how much of our supplication to the Lord is about what we want for this life, not what we need from him, really need from him? How much of it is to benefit us? How much of it is that his kingdom might come and his will might be done on earth as it is being done right now in heaven, that we would become a true group of worshipers? Folks, if we really wanted that to happen, we'd spend a lot more time in repentance and confession than we would in supplication. You know, it's easier to ask the Lord to intervene in other people's lives. It's really hard to ask the Lord to intervene in yours. Because you know what? He might just do it. And he will change us. And we will be different. And God doesn't want Emmanuel to look the same a year from now as it does now. Five years from now, he wants us to all be more mature. He wants us to be able to bring in younger believers. He wants us to be able to make disciples. That's what we're called to do. And if we can't figure out the basics of even how to talk to him in a way that he'll respond, then we are in trouble. If you ask him for something, he's not going to give you something that will harm you. He's your father. But you might be praying, Lord, I just don't know what to do. And he might say, okay, go to the mission field in a third world country among militant Muslims. <laughs> He's not giving you a scorpion, okay? He's not giving you a snake. He's giving you what you need, and that is that opportunity to understand and know him better. And we've really limited in America our understanding and ability to know the Lord because we have really framed him in the way that we think he's going to work. And you know what? His greatest will might be that we have the leader that we hate the most. We've had good leaders. We've had bad leaders all the way local level on up, right? It's human nature. God's still God. And God is more gracious in difficult times because we ask and we need and we seek. And we can put all of our eggs into a basket. And, and if, if, the, if we this happen, folks, I don't know if God wants America to survive another hundred years or not. I don't know that. I hope he does. I love America. I want my nation to do well, but we don't know what the plan of God is. That's why we seek him and we ask. And when God says, you know what, I'm giving you this guy or I'm giving you that gal or we're going to do this or, you know what, here comes a pandemic. Oh, you know what, you're not the strongest country in the world anymore. How does it feel? Like, folks, we just seek him. He's our father. He knows our needs before we bring them. He's not going to give us a snake or a scorpion. He's not going to harm us. It's not in his nature. But it doesn't mean that he will keep us out of situations that are dangerous. Simple question. Out of all the people who had two legs and walked on the earth, who did God love the most? It was Jesus. Right? It's his beloved son who suffered the most same guy doesn't mean God didn't love him and he knew he was going to suffer effective prayer is answered with God's integrity we, we ask in his name we ask for his glory we pray for others we ask for personal resolve folks Christianity is simple and I know I've mentioned this I know I've mentioned this but it is just about knowing the God who saved us but that's hard to do. It's about two great commandments, right? Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. It's about one great commission, go out and make disciples. This is not complex to teach, but it's impossible without the Holy Spirit to do. It's about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
about love and joy and peace and patience and faithfulness and kindness. It's about praying for wisdom and, and praying for patience and, and, and seeking to be the person that he's called us to be. All those things are key. We'll close with this note. Get on page with God. What has he already promised to give us? What methods will he certainly use? He's waiting to answer some prayers immediately. There are some things that you could go talk to God about right now and you'll get an answer. I guarantee it because he's asking you to ask for it. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. That's in James. God always wants to give you wisdom. Love never fails. So if you ask God for the strength to love your enemies, he will give that to you. He wants you to forgive. So, so if you'll go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm a bitter person about this situation. Give me the strength to forgive them. He will do that. He is faithful to do that. If you have sin in your life, he is faithful and just to forgive you of that. He wants to talk about that stuff. He is ready to answer those prayers. You just got to get on page with him. Will we approach him with these things? Let's pray. Father, you love us with an everlasting love. And you are so faithful to us. God, may you reveal yourself to us as we seek you, Lord. Let us understand your word. Let us understand the expectations that you have of us, Lord. Speak to our hearts. Give us wisdom. Give us strength to love. Lord, give us the peace that we need to have the stability that we must have in order to do your will. Lord, may your gospel be spread throughout this land once again. May the hearts and minds of people change. Lord, may we repent for the many times that we've depended on other things except you. Would you reveal those obstacles to us? Would you show us your heart? God, let us be persistent. Let us be authentic. Let us be faithful. Because you are all those things to us. Lord, give us anew the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That we might be able to know you in a way that we never have before. We pray this all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Let's stand together. Morning. Glad you all are here, and if you're visiting with us, uh, glad to have you, and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Uh, make note too of the uh, bulletin of activities that are going on the rest of this week and the rest of the month. Um, 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for today. God, I thank you for the change of the season, Lord, as we enter into fall and just the beauty that comes with the fall season, the change in colors, Lord, in, in your creation, God. Lord, I thank you for the message we have from Brother Jeff. God, I pray that we would, uh, Lord, we absorb that and we, that we would continue to uh, look to you, Lord, and study your word and, and be old diligent in our prayer. Um, Lord, I pray that you be with the the tithe and offerings that we take this morning, God, that we use them wisely, Lord, and uh, be with activities this week. Lord, we're going to have men up on the roof uh, doing your work, uh, working on the buildings and maintaining the facilities. God, I pray that you be with them. Lord, uh, we thank you and we love you, and we pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. As we go your spirit go before us as we go may we follow where you lead may we live what we have learned share the message we have heard and be a light unto the world as we go